Hello and welcome to my review of Cop Hater by Ed McBain. This is a 1956 novel and the first in the 87th Precinct series. These books would expand follow an ensemble cast of a police squad based in a city reminiscent of New York. McBain was a pseudonym for mystery writer Evan Hunter. Cop Hater starts with Detective Mike Whedon kissing his wife goodbye and heading out to work at the 87th. He won't make it. A hidden gunman shoots him from behind with a 45 caliber handgun and he dies in the street. This would be something of a McBain 87th Precinct staple. Nobody is safe. It is aimed to be a gritty and realistic series where cops are cops rather than superheroes. They're just men doing a dirty job and not necessarily that well. In a story sense, it is a great hook to kill your first character, rather more common now than it would have been in 1956, as all the tropes of this series are. Scott and I looked at the first page of this book in our First Line series, and I stand by what we discussed there. It's a decent opening, a little repetitive, and the line, there was garbage in the streets, should have been the first line of this book. It's such a great line. But the chapter from there does focus on Reardon, establishing him as a decent family man and his sudden and violent death a very strong way of hooking in a, in a reader. Two detectives from the 87th, Corella and Bush, are assigned to this case and the department as a whole is determined to find the killer. Reardon is one of their own, that's important, but as is the image of the department, the more fallible they appear, the more crime they will deal with. Unfortunately, other than the spent cartridges and bullets still lodged in Reardon, evidence is on the slim side. They look into Reardon's cases for someone with a grudge and literally anyone suspected of owning a 45. At 3.42 on 25 July, the ballistics report reached Corella's desk. The shells and bullets found at the scene of Mike Reardon's death had been put beneath the comparison microscope together with the shells and bullets used in the killing of David Foster. The ballistics report stated the same weapon had been used in both murders. Police work has obviously changed a great deal in the near 70 years since this book was released, but the CSI vibes from passages like that are undeniable. The cops just get down to their business, but they also spend time sniping and whining, especially about their lot and having so little to go on. Corella and Bush also swap stories about their intimate partners, with Bush apparently the most guilty of oversharing. Corella's partner is called Teddy. She is a mute, but they have a loving relationship. Bush is a warrior, or his wife Alice is, or the relationship is a bit awkward because he's calling home at all hours, especially when the concern of a cop killer seems more than possible when Rin's former partner is also shot and killed by a 45. McBain focuses a great deal on the rising heatwave that hits the city, using it to demonstrate how tensions are also rising within the group and the city itself. A reporter, Cliff Savage, investigates and raises the temperature of a local gang that he suspects of being behind the killings, even if the police don't. However, this ends with a third policeman undercover nearby being shot by the gang, though with a 22 and therefore not connected by the police to the other deaths. But still, they have so little to go on that their investigation is actually fairly slight, and most chapters focus on personalities and human interactions, so much so that the investigation ends up being related in they did, they did, it's like this one. Some of the cops went into the modus operandi file and began digging for information on thugs who used 45s. Some of the cops went to the lousy file, the file of known criminals in the precinct, and they began searching for any cheap thieves who might have crossed Mike Ridden's path at one time or another. Some of the cops went to the convictions file and began a methodical search of cards listing every conviction for which the precinct had been responsible. It is probably unavoidable with such a dearth of workable leads, but the characters and their interactions build nicely and the threat remains consistent. Cop hater through two thirds of its length is a very effective thriller. The cops get a break of sorts when the next policeman to die is Bush. He's gunned down in the street in the same way as the others. But with the police on edge already, Bush is able to get a shot off and he hits the gunman who escapes wounded. Now the police have some evidence. With a surprisingly modern seeming forensics report, able to piece together a number of deductions that reduce the suspect list considerably. Further, eventually the injured man has to seek the help of a doctor who reports the GSW and the killer flees before the police arrive. But the web now is suddenly closing. This is sadly the point of the book where things go awry a little. Savage, the reporter, invites Corella for a drink and a chat that's off the record. He has good reason not to go and none to go, but he does go. And he has a long chat, which he must know Savage will print despite his protestations because he's already shown himself to be a total douche devoid of morals. 
Worse is that Corella has a new theory out of nowhere that he spills to Savage, who then questions him at length about his girlfriend, right down to her full name and enough of her location that anyone could find her in the phone book. A great idea when a cop killer is on the loose. Well, our killer does read Savage's article and is alarmed by it, enough that he goes to Teddy's house to lay in wait for Corella and shoot him dead. Who could have seen that coming? The questioning about Teddy is so stupid and unlikely, it's almost a literary punch to the stomach because the book to that point was completely engrossing. This scene destroys the suspension of disbelief completely. Corella would have to be a total fool to do what he does. Likewise, our killer by now has discovered that Teddy is a mute and he has her at gunpoint. He also has no reason not to just shoot her dead. Instead, he waits around with her, his back to the only door through which Corella can enter, and he allows himself to be distracted by her when Corella does arrive. To be fair, though he's been an effective killer to date, there is no indication that he's actually good at it, and plenty of indications that it isn't his actual trade. But captured by Corella, he spills his guts. He was put up to the killings by Alice, who wanted Bush out of her life, and dead was better than divorced. The two other murders were simply a smokescreen to make it look like the intended target, Bush, was murdered in a spree of a random cop-hater rather than an intended hit. McBain predominantly uses a third-person narrator restricted to a single character, more often than not Corella, but he isn't afraid to change it up, utilising direct address to the reader to draw them into the gritty den of the 87th. Making the reader part of the action, part of the department, helps raise the stakes a touch, though I found this description-heavy section a little unengaging to be truly effective. Where you were was a narrow, dimly-lighted corridor. There were two doors on the right of the open stairway and a sign labelled them as lockers. If you turned left and walked down the corridor, you passed a wooden slatted bench on your left, a bench with an outer back on the right, set into a narrow alcove before the sealed doors of what had once been an elevator shaft. A door on your right marked Men's Lavatory, and a door on your left over which a small sign hung, and the sign simply read Clerical. It's not exactly riveting stuff, and there's more than a page of it, but that level of detail does add a degree of verisimilitude, as does reproducing some of the police records like this. Utilising an over-the-shoulder narrator generally keeps the identity of the killer a mystery, even when the scene is following him. McBain generally keeps that to a minimum, focusing on the men of the 87th they are, after all, both the investigators and potential victims. The amount of time spent on their female partners isn't excessive. Teddy's disability helps make her a sympathetic character, which makes Corella look like a decent and caring human as well, making him a likeable lead. The banter between the men may well have worked better in the 50s, particularly 50s America, but it is just passable when divorced from that contemporary context. Certainly the book owes a debt to Chandler, with its grit and exploration of the seedier side of city life, but it never reaches the height of either inspiration or that particular wit. Its femme fatale, Alice, is simply not in the book enough to have the impact you'd want from such a figure. Certainly she is overtly sexualised from Bush's overshares that charge Corella's few interactions with her. It gives this the feel of a 50s Catherine Trammell. There's no explicit sexual acts here, but Alice certainly simmers as much as the heat wave. Her final line, there have to be some men on the jury, men like me, demonstrates a confidence that is largely misplaced because she ends up on the electric chair. But it also hints at a more interesting story, one with more of a focus on her. But then that story exists, and it's called Basic Instinct, and it wasn't one that you could publish in the 50s. Overall, Cop Hater is a really solid police procedural that was published at a time when such things were less common. The police here work a case that is largely red herrings that go nowhere until the killer's final murder proves to be the break in the case they need. But throughout, they and their efforts are very interesting. The final act is a lurch to the finish line rather than the ending it deserved, with Corella's unlikely meeting with the reporter. Savage is key to bringing Hunter and Hunter together, but handled in a very contrived and unlikely manner. The goal of the series is to feel real, that these are interesting yet fallible humans doing a dangerous job, where the audience is kept on the edge of the seat by the promise that nobody is completely safe. You can feel the influence of Cop Hater in a dozen or more different movies, shows and police books, but it is good enough to stand on its own two feet and recommend it. As are my books, which are available on Amazon. Check them out if you enjoy science fiction and silliness. Like and sub to the channel for more videos like this one.